stop talking to me. <laughs> well, because you didn't believe her, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. The the day mom had her something or other done, I think she had it wasn't an appendix, but gallbladder it was her mm. I brought her home from that, and these Jehovah's Witnesses were standing there when I got out of the car, mm. and they wouldn't leave me alone. I was like. I just brought my mom home from the hospital. Could you please leave now? And they just kept on bothering me all the way into the house. Wow. And I and I would I just saw the door in their face. Mm -hmm. Go away. <laughs> the only ones that That's what the garden are. house is there for. <laughs> <laughs> the only ones that we get here in our neighborhood are the ones that are Spanish speaking. So they only want to talk to you if you're Spanish speaking. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Oh. Just completely bizarre. <laughs> it is. <laughs> They're like, anybody here Spanish speaking? Well, yeah. I used to get Mormons all the time at my door. No, I'm not in this. I mean, no. They're my favorite to send Mark. <laughs> I love them. They but actually Mark, talk more. Mark wants to kill me. <laughs> well, you know, I think that you uh, <laughs> you attract the Mormons somehow. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. You're a Mormon magnet. So. <laughs> I love it. Well, um, let's start with the brief prayer list. Let's be praying for Mark Holder. Okay, he's on tonight, so. Good. Yeah. Yeah, he's just kind of having some issues with, okay. you know, sit, uh, his bed and sleeping. Right, and, yeah. Yeah, um, understood. I guess he got a new mattress or something. Okay, all right. So. Always glad to pray for Mark. Yeah. He's a good one. Um, what uh, what else? Maybe so we um, having them here, um, John's um, aunt and uncle, we discovered that uh, there's a lot of medical issues going on with um, his aunt. Okay. And they, they are strong believers. They're just, you know, kind of struggling and, and a lot of other things, you know, so. Okay. Yeah. So her- Are you um, able to help them or- I think or? it at least had a little bit of a different a little bit more balance you know because they're surrounded by it mm -hmm. you know so they don't have a lot of they they were they came here and they were like refreshed so, because they're always having to do something for somebody yeah you know? so what is the prayer for them so it, it's um has to do with her digestive stuff so okay yeah okay just yeah. pray for so, endurance so, and solutions endurance definitely yeah and yes wisdom for sure yeah yeah that's, okay that's one of the biggest issues yeah to figure out what to do yeah so we're grateful for your progress yes and, uh, uh, and i'm starting to get some new students yeah Yay. Oh, all right exciting. yeah that's yeah that, that that's next so lots of praise there mm -hmm. um colorado biblical university has a praise and so we uh we signed a, a new agreement with someone this week and uh, announcements will be forthcoming, but uh, it's very significant, very cool. And uh, the Lord is blessing us and it's very exciting, exciting to be a part of and just pray for us. Uh, we've got a lot to do. And we hope to send our visa off to the French, uh, visa applications to the French consulate very soon. Uh, would like to have that outward bound this week. So pray for us and wisdom. And uh, grateful to have Alex here with us for maybe another week. So, yeah, let's pray. Lord, um, it's hard to keep a record of all the answers you give us to prayers over the year, years. Here we are, we've uh, been praying as a local body for 30 some years and countless prayers you, you've answered. Uh, you, you saved us physically, you helped us evangelize others. Uh, we thank you for uh, the spiritual uh, and eternal salvation because of prayer. Uh, we we just pray for a great many things, and uh, tonight we're uh, with grateful hearts. We're thankful for uh, Karen 
sifting through and getting new students and starting to settle in. Uh, we're thankful for uh, uh, some real uh, successes and wonderful uh, uh, partners with, uh, with our educational institution. We pray for uh, John Sant and Uncle tonight. We especially want to lift them up and help them to endure with a good Christian witness and at the same time, uh, in your perfect timing, bring solutions and wisdom to them. We uh, pray much the same for our friend Mark and ask for um, his steadfastness on the one hand and uh, relief on the other hand. Uh, help us in this visa process to be wise and to glorify you and be a good witness and testimony to you. Um, even with the uh, French government and everybody else involved. Um, it's in our heart to serve. Tonight, we study your word. What a joy, Lord. And we simply ask for the superintendence of your Holy Spirit that we might get it as you gave it. In Christ's name, amen. So we've got some narrating to do tonight. And... Um, let me let Carla in. She's always the uh, one who is very important to us. So, um, John 13, 4. I think we got to a pretty good place last week. And in John, 10, uh, John 13, 4 and 5, Jesus rose up from the supper, put aside his garments, and after taking a towel, wrapped it around himself. Then he cast water into the wash basin. So it's interesting that John, the apostle, the narrator of this, after such exaltation of Christ, you know, he came from the Father and he's going to return to him. And the first few verses are really Jesus focused. And he, he really puts Christ right where he belongs. You know, our job is to exalt Christ. Our job is to uh, keep him exactly as he is. He's both God and man. Uh, you, you know, hypostatic union, pure definition and all that. But ultimately, we observe that as God and as man, he conducted himself. Uh, and I think I, I lean a little more toward the human side, conducted himself with perfect virtue throughout his life. And as Philippians chapter two says, it's for this reason that he's highly exalted. We know he was tempted as a human being is. And, um, you know, I want to stop for a minute. Turner wrote a paper on the hypostatic union in the Garden of Gethsemane that was brilliant. So I just want you all to know that. <laughs> and uh, I, th what's wonderful about it is it preserves Christ as being truly tempted. You, you know, it's in conformance with that. Tempted in all things as we are yet without sin, passage from Hebrews. And not a, not a lot of people, probably not even the majority have gotten that right over the centuries. And uh, his paper was on Thomas Aquinas. Of all people, he got it right. And we often say that Roman Catholics get Jesus right in his essence. Aquinas got it right. And um, uh, it's just frustrating that Aquinas is so darn Catholic. <laughs> it's frustrating. As uh, Turner wrote to me, he said, you know, he just didn't get grace. But he got the hypostatic union and the Garden of Gethsemane right. So brilliant paper. Uh, so, so happy to read it and be refreshed by that. And I think, you know, this, um, John, it, it, it's so funny that John gets Christ up here. And then the, the very next thing you see, no, no transition, no nothing. He rose up from the supper, put aside his garments, but after taking a towel, wrapped it around himself, and he cast water into the wash basin. So... John now demonstrates, without any warning or transition, demonstrates the great humility of Christ, the basis for his uttermost greatness. And 
you have to try to read this for the first time again. You have to sit down and say, what if I was reading this for the first time? And I did a lot of that as I, as I studied up for this lesson this evening. So John notes these few simple preparations. And it's curious that Jesus does them without any explanation, no words at all. He just starts them. Isn't that interesting? He just, that's all he does. He doesn't warn them. He doesn't say, this is why I'm doing this. He just did it. So feet in the ancient Near East were nasty. Um, feet are gross anyway. You, you know, they're basically gross. Um, but uh, they were customarily dirty because the standard footwear was an open-toed sandal. And the ground was dry and dusty, so dust would accrue. But more than that, human and animal excrement were present where people walked. Modern sanitary science had not progressed very much. A typical city or village had uh, no uh, a way to account for sewage, then uh, empty the bedpan out the back window into the alleyway. Uh, but you had, uh, you had beast of burden along the street. Uh, you went walking along and uh, from time to time, inevitably it gets squishy on you. And <laughs> you, uh, you had that horrible squishing feeling and it's, you know, nice and warm between your toes and everything else. But so feet were not only dirty, uh, but they were a hazard to everyday health. Uh, even to touch the sandal was the lowest form of servitude. And this is why the uh, exclamation from John the Baptist, uh, there comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. You see, um, where have your sandals been all day? To even reach down and loosen the strap of the sandal was to touch that thing. And it was nasty. And he says, I'm not even worthy to touch his sandal strap, meaning I'm not even worthy. Um, it, so it's upside down, but the lowest servant in the house was the foot servant. It was a person who dealt with sandals and foot washing. And that was the low, and and so John said, "I'm not even worthy to do the lowest job, so I'm sub worthy to do the lowest job for Jesus." And uh, but it gives us a view of what the lowest job is. The lowest job is unstrapping the sandal and washing the feet. Normally, water was provided for individual guests to wash their own feet. So the next time you have people over, make sure there's a wash basin. Oh, would you like to wash your feet? Well, uh, Genesis 18, 4, a couple from Genesis. And I go back to Genesis because it's early. And so um, please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. So this is just a... a, a, a a custom, this was good manners to provide for washing the feet. Again, in Genesis 43, 24. So the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water and they washed their feet and he gave their donkeys feet. It was just a common courtesy to provide for this. Now, if there were servants, as I already mentioned, and now I'm going to demonstrate even further, if there were servants, the humblest of their duties was foot washing. Let's go to 1 Samuel 25, verses 40 and 41. 1 Samuel 25, verses 40 and 41. When the servants of David had come to Abigail at Carmel, they spoke to her saying, David sent you to us to ask you to become his wife. Then she arose, bowed her face to the ground and said, here's your maidservant, a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. And so her expression exposes uh, the lowest of servants was the foot washing servant. And she says, 
I'm here, I, you know, it, it's an amazing moment, right? It's just kind of a Cinderella moment, except, you know, this Cinderella washed the poop off of people's feet. So, you know, that's, that's her status. But I'm a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. So I'm not worthy to wash David's feet, but I'll wash it, you know, and this is just her extreme expression of humility. I kind of appreciate what Abigail is doing. And after laying our eyes on that, why don't we go to Luke chapter 7, Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 38. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. So what this woman does is a very humble service to the Lord. Um, with what we even know so far, we know that it was a customary courtesy to provide for the washing of the feet of guests. And yet this Pharisee did not do this as Jesus notes. He turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And so this is considered uh, the high. He considers her a woman of great virtue for having done this service for him when the Pharisees were, were um, scoffing and sneering at her because of uh, her uh, you know, some past sins she may have committed. So <clears throat> we should be kind of getting an idea about this foot washing thing. It's foreign to us, but to them, it was a part of everyday life. Finally, I want to mention 1 Timothy 5, verses 9 and 10. And here we have the willingness on the part of widows in the church was a sign of humility uh, to other believers in the local body. So willingness on their part, that is to wash the feet of others. So 1 Timothy 5, 9, and 10 is about regulating widows. Do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number. So they have a, a number of, uh, or in a, it says number, it means like the rules. Like they have a written down list of widows that they help. And so he, uh, Paul is simply saying, not unless she's been the wife of one man, well reported for good works. And if she's brought up children, if she's lodged strangers, if she has washed the feet of the saints, if she's relieved the afflicted, if she's diligently followed every good work. In other words, what we're looking for here is someone who, uh, is willing to do the humblest of labors uh, within those of the church. And, uh, you know, Paul is just, he's thinking of the sinful nature, I think. Uh, he's thinking of uh, a woman, oh yeah, I'll take your money, but I'm not doing any of that. You know, I'm not going to do anything. And I'm just, I, I'm used to my high station in life. I'm used to a certain way of living. I'm used to being served and not served. And if you have that attitude, you, you know, you're absolutely the wrong person to receive support from your church. And uh, so is she willing to do these things? So let me, uh, here's an interesting sidelight. And the following is from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, an old favorite of mine. Uh, and there's an article by N.J. Opperwall on foot washing. So here it goes. In the early church, foot washing came to be practiced as a rite. So we're going we're gonna to analyze in this passage 
whether foot washing should be observed as a right. So I just want you to catch that people actually made this John 13 incident into a ritual. It, in its earliest form, Opperwall Opera says, it was observed at the baptism service and involved the ceremonial washing of the feet of the newly baptized catechumens. Um, Augustine uh, did this. He, he quotes Augustine here, and um, uh, apparently in the letters of Augustine, uh, there was a mention that they would have the baptism ceremony and then wash a person's feet. So, you know, if you read this text, there's this interchange between this interaction between Jesus and Peter. And Peter says, no, wash me all the way. And Jesus said, no, you're already washed. And people are like, well, that means baptism. And so, you, you know, they do this, you, you know, they're just trying to ritualize something that Jesus was not instituting as a ritual. So we, we talk about what are the ordinances of the church. And so we say something like, well, communion and baptism, you know, ordinance, commanded, commanded. And so <clears throat> union and baptism. And I, I think there's some validity to this. Uh, leadership is commanded to baptize when people want to be baptized. I'm still looking for the passage that says that everyone uh, has to be baptized as a command, uh, you know, undergo the ritual of water baptism. Uh, people certainly were. Uh, there was no dispute about it or argument or, oh, no, we shouldn't do that. They, uh, leadership willingly uh, did that. And um, I think when it says, uh, you know, um, go therefore, or as you go, um, baptizing and teaching, make disciples, baptizing and teaching, uh, there's a sense that this is, uh, since baptism of the Holy Spirit is an ordeal, you know, we can lead someone so that they believe in Christ and the Holy Spirit does it, but this is baptizing is our responsibility. So if someone wants to be baptized, I'm, you, you know, I'm happy to do that, have on many occasions, uh, but uh, I think it's difficult to construe from the New Testament that everyone has to be baptized. And uh, there are really good reasons not to be baptized uh, under uh, extenuating circumstances. So, um, it, you know, that's where we are. Communion is certainly an ordinance. Do this in remembrance of me. It was ordained by Jesus Christ, uh, much like baptism was. Uh, but I don't think we're going to get there with foot washing. And if we could just pause for a moment and be thankful <laughs> about this, I mean, that would be good. This practice never gained, Opera Wall continues, universal acceptance, and no traces of it are left. Well, actually, it is uh, that people still do it. The right did not come to be widely practiced, however, during the Maundy Thursday <clears throat> service. So when you observe the uh, you know, during Passion Week or Passover Week, the Thursday night service in both the Western Church and the Eastern Church. At the Synod of Toledo in 694, Spain became the first European country to attest the practice of Spaniards leading the way. Uh, Rome first attested it in the 11th century, uh, called the Pedaladium. So, you, you know, I just, I don't think we're going to be the Pedalabians. <laughs> this rite continues to be part of the Maundy, Maundy Thursday observance in many churches. Among the Protestant churches and sects that have practiced foot washing are the Moravian Brethren, the Mennonites, and the Seventh-day Adventists. <laughs> So there's the Seventh Day Adventists and the Fourth Day Foot Washers. It could be either one. Uh, so I just thought you'd be interested in a 
um, quick overview of what ha what the church has done with this. It's not an ordinance. Um, I don't know. I'm against as an ordinance. I think it was for this occasion only. Uh, we can fulfill foot washing as we see, as we forgive each other, but we cannot, uh, not commanded to do it. So without speaking a word, Jesus just does this. His disciples must have been stunned. He doesn't say a word. He just wraps a towel around himself, pours water into the wash basin, and starts in. So verse the second half of verse 5, and he began to wash the feet of the disciples and to wipe dry with the towel with which he wrapped himself. So he just does this. We might also observe with curiosity uh, and maybe a mind trying to understand this, the timing of it. This is after supper. Remember, after supper, he took the cup. So it's after that. And long after they had entered the upper room. So let, let's just observe this timing for a moment. The normal custom is you enter the room, take off your sandals, and there's the water and you wash. They've been here hours. Probably, I, I would say minimum 90 minutes, three hours. I don't know. They've been there a long time. Uh, if you have a leisurely uh, Passover Seder, uh, and since we've all experienced this together, you, you know, you fill up an hour service with just going through the Seder. And um, so anyway, it's long after they entered the upper room. Uh, and because of this curious timing, the disciples would have been alert to the possibility that this was no ordinary foot washing. What is he doing? What is he doing? Because this was not the expression of normal, normal courtesy, that would indicate there's other meaning involved. Because of the nature of the task, Humility has to be the focus, but not one word from Jesus. Now, uh, not one word from Jesus, but, you know, there, there could be a couple of reasons for this. You know, he's a great teacher. He's the greatest of all time. And here, it's almost like he's an instructor. He's relaying a lesson. And it's the kind of thing that, that you do to engage the curiosity of others. And this was a real flummoxer. It was one that would just astonish them. And it's, and I, I think in 2020 hindsight, it's obvious to us, but as we're about to find out, he says, oh, you, you know, you can't understand this now. So this is uh, not about courtesy. It is about humility. But he says no words. I mean, I, I'm more of the kind who says, you know, what I'm about to do Here's all these elements, and, and this is what it means. You know, I like to give it away before I do it so that people are kind of fully engaged, but Jesus holds back from that. Not a word. And I think there's genius in this. He's really kind of planting an information bomb with a delayed fuse that will go off sometime later. So he comes to Simon Peter. And you know, there's going to be trouble. Uh, John says, therefore, he comes to Simon Peter. I even enjoy the way John phrases this. Therefore, he comes to Simon Peter. 
this is how it's this is how it's written. It's in the present tense. He comes to Simon Peter. And John even uses a, a therefore. Therefore, he, you know, he's coming to a big conclusion about this. He comes to Simon Peter. It may, Simon Peter may have even been the last of the bunch. And John phrases it in such a way that he knows his audience is going to be like, Oh boy, it's Peter. I just, I, I get this. Don't ask me why. You know, you can ask me why. I just think the way it's written that John is, is setting up his own little um, bit of information. He comes to Simon Peter and he says, he, Peter, says to him, Jesus, Lord, are you washing my feet? And, you know, um, being the snarky human being that I am, I would say, well, duh. <laughs> you, you, you know, yes. Uh, yes, Captain Obvious. <laughs> you, you know, I, I absolutely am. Lord, are you washing my feet? And, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't say a, a word or he hasn't said a word. And um, as I mentioned already, there's more afoot mm -hmm. in this activity that meets the eye. It's notable that this follows after the dispute over who's the greatest among them. And a correction from Jesus regarding the beneficial kings of the Gentiles. See, Jesus has gotten wind of a disaster that's unfolding on this night of nights before he must depart. And he must impress upon them this lesson of humility toward one another and toward God and uh, abiding in him. He must impress upon them because their arrogance and their rivalry, their inordinate ambition, their inordinate competition is just going to absolutely destroy the church, the infant church to be infected from this. And so they have the dispute over who's the greatest. And Jesus speaks to them regarding the beneficial kings of the Gentiles. And we gain that from the synoptic gospels, the Matthew, Mark, Luke gospels. And this is right at that moment. And this is significant. The timing is significant. And the event is significant. Jesus has just declared that they will rule on 12 thrones. And what does he do right after? He starts washing their feet. You will rule on 12. You will sit on 12 thrones and rule. And the very next thing, he's washing their feet. Is not Jesus the greatest among them? And yet he does this. Is not Jesus the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Lord of Lords? Has not Jesus come from the Father and is about to return to the Father in all glory? Is this Jesus, the Son of God, who resided and presided? in the heaven and became man willingly in accordance with the Father's plan. Is not Jesus the greatest among them? And yet he does this. And on the morrow, even more. Even more. So Simon Peter asked, Lord, are you washing my feet? And the text seems to indicate that Jesus had washed the feet of others before he had gotten to Peter. Not one of them spoke a word. They only let the Lord do what he did. Yet here we are at Peter. I mean, we don't know what those other guys thought, but it, 
but at least they stayed silent and let him do this. Perhaps some of them did understand. Imagine being convicted of this sin, your arrogant rivalry and competition with the other disciples. And then Jesus, the King of Kings, the very Messiah of Israel. I mean, we do have the entirety of human history of prophecy about him from the garden forward. And here he is in living flesh among you, the Messiah. They knew full well he was God. They declared it, uh, declared him to be the son of God, a Messiah on, uh, on several occasions. Here he is before them and he washes their feet. And maybe we should be in awe of this moment looking at the disciples who are <clears throat> silent. They were silent. They let him do it. And at first you're like, whoa. And then you're like, whoa. Wow. Lord, are you washing my feet? And not one of them spoke a word. They only let the Lord do what he did. But Peter asked the question, and from what Jesus says next, and Peter's response, he must think this is an improper thing. You know, on the one hand, it's good that Peter recognizes how upside down it is for the Messiah of human history to do this. Lord, are you washing my feet? You see, there's incredulity in the way that question is framed. Are you washing my feet? You can see his wrinkled brow. Are you washing my feet? And it's good that Peter recognizes the disparity between the between the king of kings, the greatest human being that ever lived, the God-man doing this to his feet. There's a disparity between the act. I don't know. The cross is messier than this by far. On the other hand, his question also indicates that he's missed Jesus' intent in washing his feet. Because the minute you start saying, it's not right that Jesus washes my feet, you start to go even further and say, it's not right that he should die for me. And there's marvel in this. And I, and I, I think it's exactly right. It's, it's perfectly right that he should die for us. And at the same time, it's an outrage that he should die for us. And it's only, it, 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 it offends my sensibilities too, because I exalt my Lord. I love my Savior. But on the other hand, it, it, it's like he did what no one else could do. On the other hand, And I think Jesus has missed that. He did it willingly. He did it willingly. And he did it in accordance with the Father's plan. And it's totally right. And it's outrageous. And Peter misses all this. So Jesus has this kind of, uh, in verse 7, this kind of request for patience. He answered and said to him, what I myself do, you do not know now, but you will know after these things. So he stops for a moment and considers what to say. Uh, well, one day I'll count how many times Jesus says, or uh, <coughs> Jesus answered and says, when the gospel writers have this expression, Jesus answered and said. Um, it's very common. There are dozens of times that he does this. Uh, we think, uh, a lot of people think, well, it's just, you know, a, 
it's just a figure of speech answers and says, but no, it's not. Uh, answer means what happens up here in your head. Speaking is what comes out after the answer has been formed here. So Jesus thinks for a moment. And you see this deliberation of Jesus, now maybe virtually instantaneous, maybe in the wink of an eye, but uh, you do see him deliberate. Jesus answers and says, he thinks before he speaks. And essentially Jesus says that even though Peter does not understand this, he will at some point. After these things, what are these things? What are we indicating with these things? After these things indicates that there are required events and experiences that must precede Peter's understanding. And along with those required events and experiences, there must be an attitude adjustment. Think of, uh, about Peter for a moment and what is going to transpire in the next, oh, 22 hours or so in the life of Peter. He's going to deny Jesus three times, is he not? Uh, those weren't even the worst thing that he did. Peter almost, and it's good that he had bad aim, mm -hmm. but he almost committed the worst sin in human history by defending Jesus from being crucified. Okay, because it had to happen. I'm glad Jesus was crucified. Boy, am I ever. Um, I have my own sorrow for my sin being a part of his crucifixion, but it is what it is. I'm glad he did it so that now I'm, I'm cleansed to serve him. But Peter wanted to stop the crucifixion. Not the best 22 hours in human history for one guy. He was on quite the roll there. So when Jesus says, after these things, he's saying there are required events and experiences that must precede Peter's understanding. And there has to be an attitude adjustment. I think there's a really good lesson in this. Spiritual growth takes time. And yeah, it, sometimes we have to go through stuff. Um, spiritual growth takes time. It takes humility toward discipline and hardship. Sometimes we go through hardship just because it refines us. And, and so it takes humility toward discipline and hardship. Um, Diff, we go through difficult stuff because God is refining us, giving us discipline, bringing us through. It takes diligence in the continued study of the word so that God's ways might be better understood. See, it takes, spiritual growth takes time. There, you get to places in your life and you look back over the last decade or two or four or, you know, however many decades we have. Let's not do too much addition here. I almost feel like we'd have to start multiplying at some point. But we, you know, we've been through all this, all these decades of studying Bible doctrine. And you look back sometimes and you say, you know, I just did not understand that. And sometimes it's, I knew the principle, but I needed to go through the ordeal so I can understand it better. It's one thing to say, you know, my um, uh, God will be faithful to me no matter what I go through. It's another thing to, to go through an ordeal and say God was faithful and look back on that panorama. It's like, you, you, you know, when you're climbing a mountain, you're exhausted, but when you get to the top, you look back over the panorama and you say, wow, it's quite the climb. But uh, if you don't study the word, 
you don't understand God's ways, and sometimes it takes a lot. Uh, there are many times in a lifelong spiritual journey when we reflect with the words, now I understand. And along with that, I want, I, I want you, you know, it's funny how this term popped into my head from um, studying under Colonel Thien 40 years ago, providential preventative suffering. You know, you hear that for the first time and you're like, and he's already, you know, five points beyond you and you're just finishing the word providential, right? So, you know, providential, and you know, I write like a fifth grader with a crayon. So, you know, I was always um, fatally behind on my notes. And then finally, you know, PPS and, you know, so anyway, I, um, I'm having flashbacks and post-trauma and all that, but uh, so, um, uh, but the providential preventative suffering is a great term. It means that God said, no, that's not going to happen for you. That is not going to happen for you. Preventative means that God prevents you from going in that direction because he wants to go, you to go in this direction and bless you in this direction. And, and, and it's providential uh, because he's got a better plan for you. So, you, you know, you, you think, well, man, this is what God wants me to do. And then it doesn't happen and you're disappointed, even devastated. And then you think, no, God's got something better. And you learn to say that after a while. God's got something better. And so there's temporary suffering while God's redirecting you. And this is, you know, this is the experience. When you look back over that panorama and you say, now I understand. I'm so glad I didn't go in that direction or we didn't do that. Providential, preventative suffering. And it's a great term. And, uh, you know, so... I, I mean, as I look at Jesus' words uh, toward Peter, what I myself do, you do not know now, but you will know after these things. Peter, you're going to have to go through some stuff. You're going to have to go through some stuff. And by the way, Jesus is uh, addressing Peter alone, second person singular both these verbs you peter do not know you peter will know and so i don't know if that means the other guys knew it but peter didn't get it and he's being very direct and personal you do not know so kind of an interesting original language moment there so peter says do not ever wash my feet. You know, it's just another denial by Peter. He's denying Jesus. Uh, imagine this, okay? Peter says to him, it's like portions of this, it's dramatized into the present tense, the dramatic present tense. And, and then Peter phrases this with a strong negation. Do not ever wash. Do you mind if I point? Mm -hmm. Do not ever wash my feet, Jesus. All right. So this is Peter commanding Jesus. Wonder how that's going to go over. So we're all going to know Jesus for a long time in heaven. In fact, forever. I just don't picture myself giving Jesus commands and orders. Don't see it happening. Okay, maybe, you know, pass the ice cream. Okay. <laughs> I mean, is that, you know, sacrilegious? Pass the ice cream. Please. No, that's just good manners. Okay. But anyway, that's what I see myself doing with Jesus.
It's interesting. Because of Peter's misunderstanding, his desire to seem right before the Lord. He's doing this. He's treating Jesus according to his understanding of the nature of a Messiah. So it's interesting that Jesus is Messiah, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, yet he's willing to do the most humble and menial of tasks. Peter says, don't do it. Do you, do you see the hypocrisy of this? If Jesus is indeed Messiah and he wants to wash your feet, shut up and <laughs> let him wash your feet. Yeah, he's telling Messiah not to do this because he's Messiah. But you don't tell Messiah what to do. It's like one of the all-time greatest Peter moments. We might think of our sins as the dirt of our lives. And there's lots of dirt, horrible dirt. He did more than wash his disciples' feet. And if you're not willing to let Jesus wash your feet, are you willing for him to die for your sins? Don't ever die for me. Because dying for our sins was far worse than physically washing feet. I, you know, there's some symbolism to it. Peter says to him, do not ever wash my feet. Such arrogance. So I'm thinking that Peter hasn't gotten a lesson yet. And that it's going to take, no, not 22 hours. It's probably going to take weeks. Till Jesus says, feed my sheep. And Peter denies him three times on that occasion. And then realizes that he's done it again. And it's ready to be a disciple. So Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you will not have a portion with me. So here's a fundamental principle. And it's one I, I think will take a, a, a lesson to remember. If I do not wash you, you will not have a portion with me. So a portion is an inheritance. The question is, are we talking about salvation? Don't think so, because, you know, as we go further into this, Jesus says, I don't need to wash you from head to toe, Peter. Just your feet. Just the part that gets dirty from walking around in this world. It is the most perfect metaphor for everyday fellowship. It, it's based on walking. What are we to do? Walk by the Spirit, right? Based on walking. Uh, it, it has a picture of dirtiness. It, it means let Jesus wash your feet. Confess your sin. Let Jesus wash your feet. If I do not wash you, you will not have a portion with me. In order to receive an inheritance, so an inheritance cannot be salvation, eternal salvation in heaven with God, forgiveness of sins, eternal life. Can't be that. It's just a portion. So Jesus is the heir of all things. And our inheritance with him, that is our above and beyond salvation reward in heaven, 
is based on letting him wash our feet. What happens if you don't let Jesus wash your feet? Confess your sin, be washed. Okay. What happens if you don't? You're out of fellowship the whole time. You're out of fellowship the whole time? No inheritance. No above and beyond reward. You're just a worldly, carnal believer. That's all you are. So foot washing is not salvation, as we will see. It's temporal forgiveness. So we have uh, four doctrines um, to examine, uh, or one doctrine, I think, uh, four aspects, abiding in Christ, the spiritual walk, fellowship, and inheritance. And these things, uh, I think we can jump in next week. We'll be around next week, two weeks from now, I'll be in Kansas City. But uh, uh, next week, um, we will get to study, I think, a one-week overview would be wonderful. And um, maybe after that, we can all wash each other's feet or <laughs> just fulfill it by also forgiving one another, even as Christ has forgiven us. Let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you. Uh, because your son died for us, we can forgive each other without penalty without incurring any debt because your son died for us we can uh, receive your forgiveness in our everyday walk and uh, continue to abide and serve in you so we're grateful to the son we exalt him as he so richly deserves in his name we pray amen <laughs>